Just curious. Have last week's hard-boiled eggs been transformed into egg salad and consumed? <laughs> Easter candy is discounted now. I know. And Easter bunnies are being replaced with gift ideas for Mother's Day. In our culture, it's pretty typical to move quickly from one event to another, isn't it? We plan and prepare for an event, and then once it's accomplished, we put it behind us and look to the next thing. Because the church recognizes this and tries to slow us down, our church calendar calls for an entire season of Easter, not just one specific day. There are seven Sundays of Easter. Officially, we celebrate Easter up until the day of Pentecost, which means we celebrate until the first Sunday in June this year. It's the week after Easter. Some call today Low Sunday. And oftentimes it is low in attendance. It's lower than the past couple of weeks. It's often low in energy. In churches, pulpits are often <clears throat> filled by substitute preachers. And some dominations often advise their church leaders to take some time off during the week after Easter because the week before is usually pretty busy in the life of the church. Today is often named Low Sunday, but this week is really not Low Sunday, not to you, not to me, because when we recognize that the risen Christ birth, burst forth from that tomb, he went on the move after that, and he didn't stop moving, and so Easter kept happening. In fact, nearly one week after the resurrection, Jesus presented himself to Thomas, the most famous skeptic in all history, and he said to him, here I am, go on, touch my hands, take, my, take your finger and put it in my side, do what it takes to find belief. And Thomas responded, my Lord and my God, see, Easter kept happening. Easter is not just a one-time phenomena. The redemptive plan that came alive in Christ's resurrection is as powerful and is as alive today as it was then. Whenever God works in and through us, Easter happens. What came alive through the events of Easter remains alive, present and available every day, every hour, every second. Easter keeps happening. Low Sunday? I don't think so. Because Easter keeps happening. Who doesn't have doubt sometimes? We all do. We all have moments when we say, really? Is it true? When it comes to doubting the resurrection of Jesus, it's like saying, I can't believe it. It's too good to be true. Today's Bible story takes place a week after Easter. Jesus had already appeared to the disciples. They were all there except Thomas. And when the others were enthused about the wonder of the resurrection, Thomas says, unless I see him for myself, I will not believe. Do you remember the first day of summer vacation? No shoes, no shirt, no getting up until you wanted to. And the best part was that a week later, it was still true. A week later, Easter is still true, but Thomas had not received the memo. He was not buying it. Not until now, that is. Why Thomas wasn't with the disciples when Jesus first appeared to them, we don't really know, but perhaps he was grieving the death of his friend Jesus and needed time alone. We don't know why. All we do know is that he was absent at the time when he first appeared. And when we think about Thomas, he was very much like many of us in that he was a realist. For him, seeing was believing. Both his experience and his common sense told him that people who have been crucified, dead, and buried don't come back to life. 
No one had ever called his cell phone from a sealed tomb, or dead people only walk in the Hollywood movies. Yet what that, that was what his friends were saying to him about Jesus. Saying that Jesus, whom he knew had been put to death by the Romans, was alive. And Thomas wasn't buying it. Thomas was thinking, no way. Thomas had seen Christ work miracles. He'd also heard him teach with great authority from the Holy Scriptures. There was no question Jesus was no ordinary man. Thomas had hoped he was the Messiah, the one who'd come to redeem Israel. But how could the Messiah be put to death? How could he who was to save the Jews be rejected by those he came to save? None of it made any sense. And that's what doubt does. It causes one to wonder and it causes one to question things and asks, is it true? We all doubt. We all have asked questions about God every now and again. Sometimes people wonder where God was when someone they love most in life died. Some will think, I've been a good Christian, I've tried to do things right, but my marriage has fallen apart, or a serious illness has set in, or maybe they've lost their job, or their teen has gotten heavy into drugs. In other words, due to circumstances in life, tragic ones in particular, doubts move in. People wonder, where is God when he says he is with us always? Things happen and they give reason for bitterness and skepticism. When things don't turn out the way one hoped they would or wanted them to, that's when doubt arises and one begins to question. In our story today, we could see that although Thomas doubted, Jesus wasn't upset. He didn't rebuke Thomas. And so the good news is, God doesn't toss you out if you doubt. The good news is that we can doubt and we can still be a follower of Jesus at the same time. We don't have to understand everything to believe something. We don't have to be able to explain everything about Christianity to believe something. And we don't have to have all our doubts worked out. But what we need to do is learn how to deal with our doubts and how to respond to them properly and well. Because if we don't, as one preacher put it, doubt can take you out. Take Peter, for example. Peter and his disciples were out in a boat in the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus went to them walking on the water. Peter sees Jesus, and he thinks, okay, I've got this figured out. If you just ask me to come, Jesus, I can walk to you on the water. Peter got out of the boat, walked on water, went toward Jesus, but when he saw the wind and the effects of the wind, he became afraid, he started to sink, and then he cried out to Jesus for help. Jesus reached out, caught him, asked why he doubted. And the fact that Jesus helped him while doubting tells us again that Jesus doesn't count us out when we doubt. But what this also tells us is that if we're not careful, doubt and it might take us out. Because Peter kept his eyes on Jesus and reached out to him, his fear and doubt didn't take him down. Sometimes, sometimes doubt will turn people away from Jesus. And when that happens, they miss out. They miss out on what God can and will do for us. They miss out on what God is willing to do for us. And so doubts must be handled properly. What did Thomas do? When he doubted the resurrection. Well, he said he needed to see to believe. But he did more than that. 
Thomas was in the upper room. He was in the upper room with other disciples, with friends. Despite his doubts and his questions, he didn't walk away from them. Instead, he shared his thoughts and his feelings with them. And isn't that a picture of what the church should be? People sharing thoughts, exchanging ideas, mulling over possibilities, lifting spirits. The comedian Bob Hope was married to his wife, Dolores, for 69 years. Dolores was a devout Catholic, and Bob loved to tell the story about the time that she got on the plane in which two priests were seated in front of her, two nuns were seated behind her. One of Hope's friends was on the same flight, and he asked Hope, why can't she take out regular flight insurance like the rest of us? <laughs> now, I doubt that Dolores believed that being surrounded by those people of faith would keep the plane in the air, but she no doubt knew that being surrounded by other believers would keep her faith up in the air. When doubting elements of faith we need the support, we need the words, we need the encouragement of others to keep us faithful to God. Tony Campola was here as our guest preacher a few weeks ago, and he tells about a baptism that he did. A single mom went forward with her child, and Tony came to the part in the service where they ask, Who? Who will ensure that the commitments and promises are carried out? Who else will be there for this child in times of need and assure that this child is brought up in the nurture of the Lord? And then suddenly he realized that she was standing up front with her child with no one at her side. And it was just as if they were on cue because at that point the entire congregation stood up and said, we will. Fellowship of believers, the church, community of faith. We need others to help us keep faithful. And not only that, when Thomas was with other people of faith, what happened? Jesus came showed up, which makes true that verse that says, when two or three gather together in my name, I'll be there. And I think John is suggesting to us that Christ appears most often within the community of believers. Separate ourselves from the church. Separate ourselves from others when we have moments of doubt and we take that chance on missing out on his presence. So fellowship with other believers is one way of handling doubt. Reading scripture is two. C.S. Lewis was one who dismissed God, turned to academics. Doubts, however, were taking their toll. He maintained God did not exist. He was also angry that God never existed. And so a few of his close friends at that time had become God followers and Jesus seekers. And Jack's first thought was, well, their conversion is nonsense. And so he wasn't interested. And then he met with other faculty with whom he admired. And both were devout believers and they urged Jack to do something that, surprisingly, he had never done before. They said, read the Bible. And so he did. And as he read the New Testament, he was struck by the chief figure, Jesus Christ. And he began to wrestle with the claims that he called himself God and offered forgiveness for people's sins. And then, after reading, Jesus concluded himself, Jesus, to be son of God. What caused C.S. Lewis, 
a gifted, brilliant, hardcore atheist to follow Jesus Christ? Put simply, he came in touch with Christ's followers. He read his word. He came in tune with his story, the scriptures. And we ask, could it be that simple? You might want to find out for yourself. Next time those doubts come, immerse yourself in the stories of the Bible, stories that showcase God's power and love, and join with other Christians and talk to them about the things that are on your mind. When doubts are handled properly and well, what happened to Thomas can then happen to us too. Doubt actually left Thomas stronger than he was before, and he didn't come out bitter, he came out better. Because out of the struggle that he had, his struggle of honest doubt was born the greatest expression of faith. Do you remember his confession? Once he knew that Jesus was alive, he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. He did not say my teacher, my Messiah, but he said, my God. And it's the one place where Jesus is called God without qualification of any kind. It is uttered with conviction as if Thomas was simply recognizing a fact, just as two plus two equals four, just as the sun is in the sky, you are my Lord and my God, he said. And this confession of the doubter is the very climax of John's gospel. Out of the mouth of a doubter became, came a grand moment of faith. And that's the way it is with doubt and faith. They're really not the opposites of each other. Faith lives on the edge of doubt. Deeper faith, deeper commitment to Jesus Christ is often the result of doubt. And the result of asking honest questions when in pursuit of knowing the truth. You might be interested in knowing that in the first three Gospels... We're told nothing at all about Thomas. It's in John Gospel, John's Gospel that he emerges as a distinct personality. But even then, there are only about 155 words about him. There's not a lot about this disciple in the Bible, but there is more than one description. I mean, he's known as the doubter, but there's more. A few weeks ago, um, I made reference to when Jesus was going to heal Lazarus. And the disciples went with them, and it was Thomas who said, it's dangerous to go there, but if he's going to go, and if he's going to die, I'm willing to die too. I'm going to go. In other words, here in Thomas, we saw a courageous st statement, and yet that's not what we remember him for. And we also fail to point out that in this story of Thomas's doubt, we have the one place in all the Gospels where the divinity of Christ is, as I've already said, bluntly and clearly stated. And so it's interesting that the story that gives Thomas his infinite, infamous nickname, the doubter, is the same story that has him making an earth-shattering confession of faith. Doubt leads to faith. So for this reason, we should celebrate the willingness of Thomas to express his doubts. And for this reason, the church should welcome honest doubts and questions. The church is not people who have all the answers, but people who doubt and yet at the same time cling to their faith in spite of the uncertainties and the questions. So what happened to Thomas after that? Well, church history tells us that he remained a faithful follower to Jesus, of Jesus. He traveled far to preach the gospel, faced trials, harsh persecution. 
But nevertheless, he continued to spread the good news, even to the point of death. Today's story, beautiful story, of an honest and devoted disciple for whom the resurrection just simply seemed to be too good to be true. Wasn't being disrespectful. Just had honest doubts, honest questions. Is it true? How can it be? In Thomas, we can see. We can doubt and still be a Christian. In Thomas, we can see it's human. It's human to doubt elements of our faith. In Thomas, we can see that doubt could be a tool for building faith. Like Thomas, may doubt do the same for us too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as a church, we are a group of people with the same belief. We are a community after your own heart. And yes, sometimes we doubt, sometimes we question and wonder if some things about you are really true. And after hearing Thomas's story today and learning about his doubts and how he handled them, we pray that our church will be a place to which we can come and be honest and a place where it's okay to express our questions because everyone has them sometimes. <laughs> And if that's true, that means the person sitting right next to us now has had doubts too. We just don't always talk about them. So we pray for our church, and we pray that you will continue to make us a church where people can come broken, sad, hurting, and questioning. And we pray that you will continue to make us a church where we can be honest with each other and with our questions. Because we want to be a church that is one that is about honesty and wanting to know you more, know you better. And we want to be people who are always seeking the truth, like Thomas. When we're with other Christians, when we read the scriptures, continue to give us the eyes of faith so that we may know with certainty that you are God. And so that we may say with certainty, too, that you are our God, always with us, caring for us, and sharing in our journey. As this next song says, and as we sit and listen to the words, we pray that you'll give us eyes to see more of you, grace to see beyond this moment, and don't let, let doubts restrain us or keep us from seeing how great you really are. This is our prayer. Amen. <clears throat>